this is where I think our program is unique in that week one, you're getting into ethical design practices and not just in a performative way of like, we should all practice ethical design. Well, what does that mean? Yeah. How do I do that? Yeah. And so we look at like some different frameworks that you can do for risk assessment uh, and harm analysis to make sure that you're looking at who's represented in your research. If you go out and survey, uh, you know, a hundred middle-class white people and then look at the results of that survey and say, well, here's our customers, then you're going to be making choices that only benefit the hundred middle-class white people that you surveyed. Right. So who's represented in the research by who are we omitting from the research who could potentially be harmed if their voice isn't there? Right. Right. What are we not looking at? What are we not considering? What future effects are we not aware of? And what, what, what questions do we not even know to ask right now? Yeah. So it's that curiosity thing, right? It, mm. it, it's it's that's what really makes designers an interesting bunch. Is because yeah. the curiosity is constantly driving us to try to connect the dots that seem disconnected. Yeah. Uh, the the thing that's interesting about that then is when you make a decision to, if you go to a company as a designer and they're talking about adding a potential feature that has the potential to make the company X amount of revenue. But when you do a deep dive into it, much like you said with that surveying that particular group and not identifying how harmful it can be to pretty much everybody outside of that group. And as a designer, like that puts you at, at a little bit of a quandary, right? Because your organization sees this as an opportunity to make money, but you as a dis ethical designer, or at least wanting to be a, pra a practice being an, an ethical designer, you're seeing this as counter to your morale, right? Mm -hmm. Your morality as a person. So how do you, how do you balance those two? I mean, it's a, it's a loaded and difficult question, but like, how do you balance that? Because I'm sure a, a ton of companies, companies won't publicly say it, but they obviously companies have done things that are good for some, and bad for a lot in the sake of making money. How do you navigate yeah. that as a professional? Yeah. I mean, there's a couple of, <laughs> there's a couple of different angles at play here, right? I mean, it's easy to say these things when like you have a good job in tech and you have those type of choices made available to you. Right. Not everyone has the type of choices that we have. Some people just need a job. Right. Right. And are excited to get into it in any way possible. Right. What I like to do is sort of back away from the sort of morality part of it and just talk about the business part of it. Because that's something that like stakeholders uh, and cross-disciplinary teams can kind of get around. They can rally around that. So yep. instead of looking at it as like a morality thing and trying to argue from a place of, you know, it's not moral to send our users notifications that make it seem like they're going to miss, you know, whatever opportunity or whatever. I like to think about it as like, what are we opening ourselves up to in terms of risk? So there's a case study from I don't know, maybe a year or two ago, and many people might be familiar with it, but like Domino's Pizza, uh, their website was not accessible to uh, certain people with um, cognitive and uh, visual and maybe even auditory, I can't remember, impairments. So it was not an accessible website. Yeah, People with impairments could not order pizza using their new tool. And they had invested, you know, mil hundreds of thousands, if not a million dollars into rolling out this new pizza tracker tool or whatever it was. Yep. Well, enough people wanted Domino's pizza that they uh, got together and they said, well, we're going to sue you and we're going to bring a, a lawsuit because you haven't made this service accessible to everyone. And Domino's said, no, we're not going to do it. It's going to cost, I can't remember, I think it was something like 300000 extra dollars to make it accessible. Yeah. It wasn't anything like ridiculous for a company like Domino's. Right. Uh, but they said, we're not going to do it. They were okay. Whoever the stakeholders were in that decision were okay with saying, there is a group of people out there that our services are not for. You know, they're not represented in our values as a business. 
Now, no one said that explicitly, I'm sure. Right. But that was the brand hit. That was the sort of perception of what was going on. Right. Well, anyway, they they lost, I think, the 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 case, or at least they ended up doing it, is all I know of the outcome. They ended up having being forced to make their site accessible and inclusive to all user types. And I mean, the money it would have cost to just do it from the beginning yeah. was nothing compared to probably the brand trust percept or the loss of brand trust yeah. and percept public perception that yep. went in that. So I, I, I talk about some of these decisions in those terms of like, do we really know what risk we're opening ourselves up to by making some of these decisions or by not doing due diligence in the research part of this? And this is why it's so important to do like really good, credible research and make your findings transparent yeah. to the whole business. Because if they don't know, they don't know, right? They don't know yeah, what they yeah, don't yeah. know a lot of times. So I like to think that, yes, designers do have an ethical responsibility to like ask these questions, at least ask the questions like as the first thing. And that can do a lot. That can get the conversation started.